In, in this video, we're going to focus on section 9.3. We're looking at two different types of statements, the if-then statement and also the if and only if statement. So first, look at, let's look at this symbol here. This might be familiar from section 9.1. When we write this, a uh, most common way to read this is if P, then Q. So this is an if-then statement. Um, let's think of this type of statement as a promise. And we're going to do a quick example just to illustrate what that means. So for a quick example, um, let's imagine that our boss comes up to us and says the following. Say the boss says, um, if, if the client likes you, then you get a promotion. So that's an example of a promise or um, stated otherwise, that's an if-then statement. So let's make a little table here representing what could happen. So there's the question of whether the client likes you. And there's a question of whether you get a promotion. And uh, so we're going to make a little table here representing the different scenarios that could play out. And we're just going to ask the question, is the promise kept. All right, so let's think about the different scenarios here. In thinking about whether the client likes you, there would be two scenarios where yes, the client likes you and two scenarios where no, unfortunately, the client does not like you. Um, and then in each of those scenarios, you might either get a promotion or not. So let's say yes, no, to cover those two cases, and then yes, no, for these two cases. So those are the four possibilities that could play out. And in each case, we're going to think here about whether our boss's promise is kept. So if our client likes, uh, let's say the client likes you and you get a promotion, then yes, the promise was kept. But if the client likes you and you don't get your promotion, that's a situation where we'd say the boss did not keep their promise. So no, the promise is not kept there. Now, if the client does not like you, um, then really, your boss had not promised anything to you in that case. The promise was only about what would happen if the client likes you. So by default, we would say, yes, the boss did keep their promise. Um, certainly the promise, the boss did not break their promise in that case because they never indicated what would happen if the client does not like you. So there's really only one situation here where the promise is broken. So let's label that and let's say, broken promise right there. That broken promise only happens in the situation where the first thing um, is true, the client likes you, and then the second thing fails to happen. So you fail to get your promotion. So let's see if we can turn this idea into a truth table. Essentially what we're trying to get at here, now that we're done that quick example, uh, we're trying to build a truth table for P implies Q. So when we say P implies Q, that's just another way of saying if P then Q. All right, so let's think about our truth values for P and Q, and then we'll think about what that's gonna mean for the truth values of this statement here, whether we read that if P then Q, um, or whether we read that P implies Q. So there would be two scenarios where P could be true, two scenarios where P could be false, and in each of those scenarios, Q could be either true or false. So that's our basic setup for a truth table uh, with two simple statements, P and Q, in it. Um, and then let's try to encode what we did in our previous example and try to figure out what the truth values of if P then Q should be. So there's only one situation where the promise is gonna be broken. That is this situation here where P is true and Q is false. So in that situation there, the promise is broken. And if we think of if P then Q as being our promise, that's the situation where um, if P then Q should be false. In all the other situations, if P then Q is going to be true. So that's what our truth table for if P then Q looks like. And we could just encode this verbally by saying, um, this statement here, if P then Q is going to be false when 
P is true and Q is false. So that's verbally encoding what we said in that truth table there. All right, so to practice this, we're gonna do one bigger example of building a truth table when we see this kind of if-then statement coming up um, into, the, into the compound statement. So here's our example. Let's build a truth table. For the compound statement, R implies P and Q, or you could read that as if R then P and Q. So first thing I would observe here is that there are three statements, P, Q, and R. Because there are three statements, if we think about how many possible combinations of truth values there would be for these three statements, we'd say, well, there are two options for P, it could be true or false, times two options for Q, times two options for R gives us eight different possibilities. So that's how many rows we're going to need in this truth table. All right, so let's set up our columns for P, Q, and R in the usual sort of way. So there are going to be four situations where P is true, four where P is false. Um, you might find it easier to read if you do a horizontal line halfway down this. That's just totally optional. For me, it helps me um, read it a little bit more easily. And then for Q and R, let's generate the four possibilities for their truth values. So true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. And then we need to repeat those same four um, combinations of truth values down below because we're now capturing all the situations where P is false. Okay, so that's our basic setup uh, for any truth table that involves P, Q, and R. And now let's think about what we're going to need um, to construct the truth values for this compound statement here. So we know R. Uh, next thing I would think about is P and Q. And then once we figure out the truth values for P and Q, we could do the truth values for if R then P and Q, and that would give us the final column of our table. Okay, so let's think about it. This is gonna build on what we did in our previous section. Um, P and Q is gonna be true when both P and Q are true. So true in these two situations here and false in all of the other six rows. And then now that we've done that, we're gonna think about this if then statement that we've got over here. Um, so thinking back to what we said a moment ago, remember that the if then statement is gonna be false in any scenario where the first thing is true and the second thing is false. So that's gonna happen in this scenario here. It's gonna happen again there and it's gonna happen one more time there, where R is true and P and Q is false. That's the scenario where the promise is broken. So I would just write F in those three um, rows there, and it's gonna be true in every, in every other situation. So true, true, true here, um, and true in those two scenarios towards the bottom. Okay, so that's our first example of using an if-then statement within a bigger compound statement. That's how you go about building the truth value um, in that scenario. So we're going to come back and talk about this kind of if-then statement a little bit more at the end of the video, um, but we're going to change gears for a minute here, and we're now going to look at a statement that looks like this. So if we put two arrows um, on the end of this horizontal line here, then this is actually read as P if and only if Q. So this kind of statement, P if and only if Q, is true when P and Q have the same truth values. Okay, so that's the rule that we're going to use to build the truth table for P if and only if Q. 
So let's think about what our truth table would look like. We'll start with our two simple statements, P and Q, and then we're going to think about truth values for this new statement here, P if and only if Q. Right, so two scenarios where P could be true, two where it could be false, and in either of those scenarios, Q could be either true or false. And based on what we've uh, defined up here, we're saying P if and only if Q is going to be true whenever the truth values for P and Q match. So it'll be true if both P and Q are true. It will be true if both P and Q are false. Um, but it will be false if either one of the statements is true and then the other one's false. So this statement, P if and only if Q, is really like a promise that goes both ways. Um, it's saying if P happens, then Q happens, and also if Q happens, then P happens. And if you think about a promise that's going both ways, the only time that double promise can be satisfied is if both of your statements are true, both of P and Q are true, or if both of them are false, then the promise would also um, go both ways because the promise would never kick into play. So to test whether we've understood that, let's do um, one more example of building a truth table. So let's build the truth table for, we're going to do P or Q, if and only if R. So again, this is a scenario where we have three simple statements, P, Q, and R, coming up into, into our compound statement. So therefore, when we think about building our truth table, we are going to need eight different rows here. So let's focus on that part first. We're going to have four situations where P is true, four where P is false, and I might draw a horizontal line halfway across just to keep my rows in order. And then uh, for the four scenarios where P is true, let's think about the four possibilities for Q and R. So we could have true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. And we'll have those same four possibilities again um, for the situations where P is false. So true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. And we do like to always do it in that same conventional order so that if you are checking your answers in the back of the book, for example, when you're doing your suggested homework, um, your ordering of the rows will match with what's in the book. Um, and also if you were comparing your work with someone else's to have it done in a conventional way, it just makes it really easy to share information. All right, so let's look at our compound statement. So working inside the brackets first, we would need to understand the truth values for P or Q. Um, we would then have P or Q and we'd have our information about R so then we could jump right into doing P or Q if and only if R. Okay, so let's try it. Um, we'll focus on the truth values for P or Q here. So P or Q is going to be true if at least one of P or Q is true. So it would definitely be true for all the scenarios where P is true. Um, it's also going to be true when Q is true and will only be false in the bottom two scenarios here. Okay, now to finish off this truth table, we now need to look at the columns for P or Q and for R. So we're going to be looking at these two columns. And the operation that we're doing on these two columns is this if and only if operation. So this if and only if will be true if we see matching truth values. So if they're both true, it's true. But if the truth values are different, like one false and one true, then it's gonna be false. So we'll have true, false, true, false. And then as we look at the bottom four scenarios, true, false, false. And when they're both false, the if and only if will be true. So that's a little bit of practice with truth tables involving the if-then statements and also the if and only if statements. So we now want to go back and talk about the if-then statements in a little bit more detail. A couple more ideas we want to talk about related to those if-then statements. And to warm us up for our next idea, let's do a quick example. So I'm going to draw a Venn diagram here, 
And in this Venn diagram, we're just going to think about the different days last month. And specifically, we're going to focus on the weather for each day last month. So this is somewhat simplified. We're going to imagine that a day can just be classified as being rainy or cloudy or sunny, for example. So that's oversimplified because sometimes the weather varies throughout the day. But let's just say for this simple example that we can do that. So some of the days last month, let's say they were cloudy days. So days that were cloudy um, would be represented inside the circle. Days that were not cloudy would be represented outside the circle. Okay, and then within the set of cloudy days, some of the days would have been rainy. So let's say every time it rained, there were clouds in the sky. Um, that's almost always true. Occasionally you can get these weird sun shower moments where it's raining and there aren't any clouds, but that's, I would say, pretty rare. So let's exclude those from our discussion. And let's just say for all the days last month, every single time it rained, um, there were clouds in the sky. So the set of rainy days would be a subset of the cloudy days. And in terms of our Venn diagram, we'd have the rainy days sitting inside the cloudy days like that. Okay, so really, just to avoid overcomplicating things, let's not even care about the days that weren't cloudy. I'm just going to erase this outer box there. And we're just going to think about the cloudy days last month. So we're going to focus on these two circles. Okay, now there are a few different ways of expressing the relationship between uh, the rainy days and the cloudy days, but I'm going to show you the six most common ways to say this. So we could say, if rainy, then cloudy. So this is kind of a shorthand way of saying it, but basically we're saying if a day was rainy, then that day was cloudy. Um, you could say cloudy if rainy. So a day was cloudy if it was rainy. You could say rainy implies cloudy. Or a rainy day implies a cloudy day. You could say rainy is sufficient for cloudy. So knowing that a day is rainy is sufficient to conclude that it was cloudy. That would be a longer way of saying that. Um, you could say cloudy is necessary for rainy. So knowing that a day is cloudy is necessary to conclude that a day was rainy. Um, that's just like saying you don't have any rainy days out here. So cloudy is a necessary condition for it to have, to have been rainy on a certain day. Um, and final way you could say this is you could say rainy only if cloudy, which is really just another way of saying you don't have any rainy days out here. All of the rainy days are sitting inside uh, the set of cloudy days. So it can be rainy only if it was cloudy that day. All right, so what we want to work towards here is actually encoding this not in terms of rainy and cloudy days, but we actually want to write this in terms of any simple statements, P and Q. So let's write this down more generally. We're going to call this six equivalent statements. And we're really just going to try to encode what we said in this example here. Um, so first equivalent statement would be if P then Q. Second equivalent statement would be Q if P. And so when we say equivalent statements, what that really means is statements that are um, conveying the same information, they're just worded differently. So if P then Q means exactly the same thing as Q if P. It's just saying it in a different way. Um, just like saying up at the top of the screen here, if rainy then cloudy means exactly the same thing as cloudy if rainy. 
So we're basically going through this rainy, cloudy example, and just in place of rainy and cloudy, we're saying P and Q to make it a bit more general. All right, so we got two ways of saying the same thing. We're going to put um, four other ways into this list. So you could say P implies Q. That's another way of saying if, if P then Q. Um, you could say P is sufficient for Q. So that's yet another way of saying um, if P happens, that forces Q to happen. A couple more ways of saying this. You could say Q is necessary for P. And what you might want to think about as we're listing these equivalent statements is you might want a visual. If you compare this to what we did in our last example, um, you could actually think about a Venn diagram where P is the special condition that's sitting in the inner circle. Q is the more general condition that's sitting on the outer circle. Um, and in each of these statements, we're just finding another way to say that if we know we're sitting inside P, then we can conclude that we're also sitting inside Q. So to say that Q is necessary for P um, is like saying P can't happen out here. So in order for P to happen, Q must be happening, whatever that condition Q is. Okay, and sixth and final way to say this, you could say P only if Q. And again, that's just another way of saying P can't happen when you're outside the circle for Q. So P can happen only if Q also happens. All right, so there are six equivalent statements and we've got a picture beside that if you find that picture helpful just to visualize um, which way the logic goes. So we need one final definition just to wrap up this section. So let's say you're given a statement of the form P implies Q, or you could alternatively read that as if P then Q or Q if P, or any of the other um, three ways on that list of equivalent statements. What we want here are names for P and Q. So the first thing, P, is called the hypothesis. And Q is called the conclusion. Okay, so if we're thinking in terms of the usual um, if-then type of statement, if, whenever you say if P then Q, the thing that you're saying if this happens, that's your hypothesis, and the thing that you're saying then this happens, that's your conclusion. Um, so maybe a better way of understanding that is just, again, to go back to our picture. So the hypothesis is the thing in the smaller circle here, the circle that's contained in the bigger circle and the bigger it's, uh, circle itself is called the conclusion. So you're saying if the hypothesis happens, if you're talking about a situation where you're in here, um, then you know for sure that the conclusion is happening. You know for sure that you're within that bigger circle as well. So that's all we needed to say about if-then statements. And along the way, we also saw if and only if statements. Um, this is something that I believe you will use in other courses. It's something that I believe you'll use in everyday life when you're talking to people, writing, um, expressing ideas in writing, reading through contracts or any other legal documents. Um, logic's really useful in a wide variety of applications. So thanks for watching this video, and this was the final video for our course, so I just want to congratulate you on making it through the course. Please give yourself um, a great big pat on the back, great job for getting through the material, and I've really enjoyed sharing all this information with you. Thanks.